Welcome to an introduction to managerial accounting brought to you by Parkbench Tutors and narrated by David Hopcroft. For more information about Parkbench Tutors, please visit parkbenchtutors.com. In this podcast, we are going to take a look at the concept of cost allocation, including looking at why indirect costs are allocated, how they can be allocated, and the potential weaknesses of cost allocation. Cost allocation refers to to how we transfer costs from shared resources. We call these costs indirect costs and they include shared resources such as the costs associated with human resources, accounting and providing cleaning and security services. These are all costs that cannot directly be assigned to a product or a service. We start by asking two questions. Why are the costs allocated? And how may we allocate the costs? There are a number of reasons why we might want to allocate costs. The first is that cost allocation is a requirement for gap reporting, where the full cost of a product is reported. One purpose of managerial accounting is to help planning. Cost allocation assists in this process. Cost allocation reduces waste of resources, and it assists in the processes of internal evaluation and assessment. Whenever a decision is made by a department to use a resource, there will be an opportunity cost. If there is no work going on in the department where the request has been made, then opportunity cost can be considered as zero. However, if the department is busy on other work and needs to hold that work, then there will be an opportunity cost. That cost will be charged to the department making the request. Without charges were allocated, then waste is likely. Consider the use of copiers in many educational establishments. If there were no charges to departments, then unnecessary additional copies might be made. Copies may be made for personal use. And the amount of paper used and copies made might not match. Charging for use of a copier helps to reduce such waste. Typically, charges may be allocated for the use of human resources, legal services and cleaning. Charging for use will encourage managers of other departments to review and be careful in the use of services from these departments. Cost allocation encourages managers to evaluate the use of the services provided. Gap reporting is required to use cost allocation and indirect production costs are allocated to goods. Cost plus agreements are contracts that use the cost plus a fixed amount or percentage. They are sometimes used for defense contracts and where the costs of research and development need to be covered. The problem with this type of contract is that very often more more overhead is allocated to them so that less is charged to other goods. The process of cost allocation is carried out in three steps. First, the cost objectives are identified, then the cost pools are determined, and finally the allocation base is selected to relate the cost pools to the objectives. The objectives of a business is to provide a product or a service, or both. Trip and Stumble make small kitchen appliances and have three main selling lines, the Wurzel, Nudget and Grimback. Production for each line includes plastic moulding, preparation of a circuit board and then assembly. The use of the moulding machine is identified as a cost pool for the objective of making the Wurzel, Nudget and Grimback appliances. The costs from this cost pool can now be allocated to these products. The firm needs to select an allocation base. There are two common methods. They relate to the use of direct labour hours or the use of machine hours. The relationship should be selected on what is termed a cause and effect basis. The greater the activity of the moulding machine, the greater is the cost, since the machine will be in use for longer. Machine hours would be a useful allocation basis in this case. The firm discovers that the total cost of the machine use is $400,000 for the year, and that it is used for 8,000 hours. Dividing cost by hours, we get an allocation cost of $50 per hour. This is the allocation rate. Based on machine use, the table shows the costs allocated to each product. 
trip and stumble also determine that there is to be an allocation rate for the administrative costs, and that this is to be based on direct labour hours, at a charge of $5 per direct labour hour. The table shows the cost allocated to each product as a result of this. There is a point to be made here. The allocation base for each cost pool can be different. In this example we used machine hours for one cost pool and direct labour hours for the other cost pool. The combined effect of these two charges on each product cost is shown in the table. Cost allocation for indirect fixed costs using allocation bases works well when the relationship can clearly be established with the cost pool. The measurement is fairly simple to make. However, sometimes it is not always easy to establish a clear relationship or the allocation base. There are other possible methods that you may find are occasionally used. Relating the time spent using a resource to relative benefits is one such method. Allocating on the basis of a department's ability to bear the cost is another. An allocation based on what managers see as fair is another. For all of these methods it is clear that there is a large measure of subjectivity, so these methods are often seen as rather vague. Many firms will group the departments into production departments and service departments. Service departments provide services to production departments, and the charges for the services are allocated. Examples of service departments include maintenance, cleaning, security, human resources and accounting. Under the direct method for allocation, the costs are allocated from service departments to production departments. Costs are not allocated between service departments. The firm of Parry and Jones has maintenance and human resources service departments, and each of these will allocate costs to the construction and packaging departments. The diagram shows these relationships, charges going from service departments to production departments, and then the charges within these departments being allocated to production lines for fencing and furniture. Let us work through an example to illustrate this. Maintenance costs of $100,000 to be allocated and human resources a sum of $80,000 to be allocated. The floor area has been chosen as the allocation basis for maintenance and is charged at 50 cents per square meter. Using this base, construction is charged $45,000 and packaging is charged $5,000. The charging from human resources is allocated per employee at a rate of $100 per employee, producing a charge of $35,000 for construction and $10,000 for packaging. There are a number of potential weaknesses concerned with cost allocation. These include what to do about costs that cannot be easily allocated, whether some allocation is arbitrary, whether it makes fixed costs appear variable at times, whether sufficient cost pools are being used, and whether volume-related allocation is the best method. A particular problem occurs if cost allocation is used to evaluate performance of managers. In order to do this, it is necessary to ensure that only the costs that can actually be controlled in some way by that manager are being considered. Non-controllable costs should not form a part of the manager's evaluation. There will always be an arbitrary element in choosing the allocation base, and the base may actually be more suitable for one department than it is for another. It is important to realize that there is not a correct allocation base for each department. The aim is to allocate fixed costs from departments, but if the wrong base is used, then the results may not have the intended effect. In some cases, the fixed costs may appear to be variable costs to the manager of a department. This can happen when costs are based on units. And in this example, we will consider what happens if allocation is based on sales dollars. Rowena Williams has been asked to determine the effect of increasing production in her department, where costs have been allocated at a, relate, at a rate of 12 cents per sales dollar. She begins a calculation to see what happens if 25 extra units are made. 
Rowena's department produces king-size wimbles that sell for $900 each. So additional sales revenue is $22,500. She now determines the additional costs for direct labour based on units, the additional costs for direct materials based on units, and the additional overhead in the department. Subtracting these from sales, she believes there will be an increase in profit of $2,500. However, she now has to consider the additional charge for fixed costs that was based on $0.12 cents per sales dollar. This means an additional charge of $2,700. Taking this into consideration, it now appears that increasing production by 25 units will actually produce a loss of $200 on those units. The problem is that the total of fixed costs have not really increased in the charging department but treating them as based on unit costs makes them appear as a variable. Managerial accountants should be aware of these potential problems with unitization. Shiver and Barrett produce air conditioning units, and we will consider what happens if too few cost pools are used. A total of $6 million is incurred as overhead and is allocated based on 100,000 direct labour hours. This gives an allocation of $60 per hour. When the managerial accountant looked at the figures in more detail, it was determined that costs could be broken down differently. Production incurred $4 million of overhead and used 85,000 hours, giving an allocation rate of $47.04 per hour. Assembly had $2 million of overhead and 15,000 hours, giving an allocation of $133.34 an hour. The production of two AC units showed a maximum model requiring 17 hours in production and 3 hours of assembly, whilst the compact model required 19 hours of production and 1 hour of assembly. Now let us look at charging the overhead. Using a single cost centre each requires 20 hours of labour at $60 an hour. So the overhead is the same, $1,200 for each model. When the two cost centers are used, then the charges for production and assembly of each model will be different and are shown in the table. Adding these charges, we see that using two cost pools, the maximum should be charged overhead at $1,199.87 a unit, but the compact should only be charged at $1,027.29 per unit. When a single cost centre is used, then the compact model is being overcharged with overhead. If charges are related only to volume, then figures can be misleading. Accountants realise that there are situations where charges or allocation should be based on the activities required to produce a unit. This led to the use of activity-based costing, and this will be the subject of the next podcast. This ends our podcast on cost allocation, brought to you by Park Bench Tutors and narrated by David Hopcroft. Thank you for watching and for listening. We wish you success in your studies. For more information about Park Bench Tutors, please visit parkbenchtutors.com.